<clears throat> you like jazz? Okay, so I don't even know. Uh, yeah. So, uh, what's <laughs> what's going on, DreamWorks? You, <laughs> you good, bro? I mean, this is the same DreamWorks that created the actual cinematic masterpiece of Shrek 2. The same one that made this iconic and critically acclaimed trilogy. And also the same one who literally invented the most well-crafted and sympathetic villain ever known as the Verminator. And now we have, <laughs> you know, this. <laughs> So, my eyes are correct! So, here's the thing. I don't even know how to do this video. If you haven't seen this movie in a long time, then you're probably really confused. But like, let's be real, it's B-Movie. We've all seen it. The one starring and written by Jerry Seinfeld, which had to have been based off of one of his fever dreams, I hope. And also the one with the most misunderstood character ever, who we'll get to. But if you're like me and you just remember it as a fun little kids movie, <laughs> You are going to be blown away by how genuinely insane this thing is. B-Movie is a 2007 socio-political thriller directed by Simon J. Smith and Steve Hickner. Compared to its budget, it got a pretty lackluster box office, and even a lackluster, er, ratings. Which really took me by surprise, as this was one of my favorite movies as a kid. When I first thought out to do a video on this movie, I was just thinking it was going to be a quick little fun thing I could get nostalgic about, and then move on. And then I rewatched it. And wow, <laughs> again, I don't even know how to do this video because there's a lot to unpack here. This is definitely way more than I bargained for. But I'm, you know, uh, too lazy to pick another movie, so we're just gonna go with it. Without further ado, let's pick our lifetime jobs at Hunnix, dive deep into the fractured mind of a broken man who lost everything, and figure out what, <laughs> whatever's going on here. This is. B movie. We open with the Moon Man, who just seems to get bullied in every single movie he's in. But at least he's still not as down bad as this dude. We get some narrator dude telling us about how bees shouldn't be able to fly, which they spin into some inspirational thing. Which really doesn't apply to this movie's message by the end of this movie, but okay. Jerry Seinfeld comes on screen playing none other than Barry B. Benson. And <laughs> you guessed it, this film is based on two things. Seinfeld's fever dream and bee puns. And a perfect report card. All bees. I get it. Comedy go! We see the entire hive, as well as get a score that has no right going this hard. They go to their graduation. Well, Adam, today we are men. Now that we're men. And I love how their graduating classes are just times. Really puts things into perspective of just how insignificant one single bee is made out to be. They go to Hunnex Industries to learn about the jobs. And we get this interesting little tidbit. That girl was hot. She's my cousin. She is? Yes, we're all cousins. Which I guess makes sense, but they really lean into it. Aren't they our cousins too? Distant, distant. So anyway, moving on. Barry B. Benson then just now learns that once you pick a job, you keep it for the rest of your life. And he's not too fond of it. First of all, how did he not know this? I mean, I'm pretty sure that would be day one of B-School, right? And if it's true that they never really told them, then you're telling me that Barry B. Benson is the first B in existence to want to go up against the status quo? But second, this does actually bring up an interesting concept about the world we live in, primarily about capitalism. But, again, it really doesn't apply to this movie's message by the end. Barry B. Benson then sees the pollen jocks- sorry, sorry, he just has such a fun name to say that I'm gonna keep calling him by his full name. But he's in awe of the pollen jocks and wants to become one. But you honestly a beautiful shot of Barry B. Benson looking out at the hive, until it's time for him to make his job decision. But because he's different and not like other bees, he decides to go with the pollen jocks. It's clever how they portray them as planes about to launch into battle, and they leave their hive to see beautiful Manhattan. Even though, since he's never really only heard stories of this mythical place, he really should be way more affected by this than he is. Probably either having an existential crisis or just straight up petrified. No in between. I mean, really anything to whatever this is. Balawa. After flying past these bikers who seem way too calm getting swarmed by bees, we get introduced to the absolute best and most misunderstood character in the movie. The film's true protagonist, the one who makes even Steppenwolf bow down to him, and uh, apparently has both super hearing and super strength. <clears throat> huh? What? My guy, Ken. What an underappreciated 
king. But we'll get more into his deep, fractured backstory later. So for now, please enjoy this meme of him as Elsa from Frozen. Which, honestly, <laughs> would have been a way better movie, but anyway. After we get this scene in the car, which always made me laugh with how little it makes sense. If you don't move, he won't sting you. Freeze! He blinked! Barry B. Benson flees to an open apartment to get away from the rain. Oh, and Ken continues to steal the show. I made it into a fold-out brochure. You see? Folds out. Ah, uh, Ken really is too pure for this world. Ken keeps boasting about his true power, which like, as the king should, including how he even apparently predicted global warming. But Barry B. Benson falls in the guac, until Ken goes sicko mode. Watch out, watch out, watch out! However, he's stopped by the true villain to our misunderstood hero, Vanessa. Vanessa stops him from killing Barry B. Benson, even though he's literally allergic. And then we get this romantic scene. Uh, I'm sure this is just a one-time joke and won't actually lead to a real romance, <laughs> right? So Barry B. Benson feels like he has to thank her, which like, <laughs> why? I mean, yeah, she saved him, but does he not understand how much everything will be different after he gives away the secret that bees can talk? Or how much therapy Vanessa's gonna have to be in? But to be fair, if any bee was this much of a smooth chad, I'd be okay with it too. You like jazz? So Barry B. Benson talks to her, of course leaving her in a state of mental and emotional turmoil. Hi. <gasps> But it does lead to one of the most genuine laughs I always get rewatching this just for how random it is. Oh! Oh! That was a little weird. They talk in the rooftop and. Yeah, I don't know when the joke ends or. Back in the hive, we get. Um. Yeah. <laughs> 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 When do we get the free food? So Vanessa takes Barry B. Benson to a supermarket, where he finds out that honey is being sold to humans. And apparently no bee has ever found out about this. Which like, how? Where do they think all that honey goes? Because it's obviously not in the hive. But you know, I guess we really shouldn't be questioning a movie who decided to name their insect version of Larry King, B. Larry King, instead of Larry Sting. Seriously, it was right there. Barry B. Benson just goes all Mission Impossible on us and tries to get to the bottom of it. But all of a sudden, we get this guy who challenges even Ken's parable as he somehow hears an insect from across a warehouse. He is here. I sense it. Seriously, I never knew I needed to see a Mortal Kombat type spinoff with these two omnipotent beings. And then he shows to be a true expert with a thumbtack. I mean, at this rate, this guy may have the power to go up against the Verminator. No, no, I forgot. No one's as powerful as the Verminator. Do you, in fact, have an associate's degree from Vermtech? Barry B. Benson chases after the honey truck, but not before coming across Chris Rock, playing Chris Rock. And somehow, this movie keeps throwing even more omnipotent beings at us as we get the most sinister yet smooth line in any movie ever. They make the honey, and we make the money. But I'm sure this is the last of these powerful creatures, you gotta be kidding me. At Honey Farms, Barry B. Benson finds his fellow bees trapped in a fake hive, with a very early 2000s joke. This is your queen? That's a man in woman's clothes. That's a drag queen. After this yogurt becomes the true warrior challenging Ken's power level, Barry B. Benson says he's going to sue the human race. And we get this Ken line, which I can guarantee you will not be the only time I have to use it in this movie. What? Then, out of literally nowhere, we just get another character who is just oh so powerful. My guy, the lawyer. And somehow, some way, these two scenes have the same energy. As Barry B. Benson is making his opening argument in the trial, he sends the over the hedge baron, and no, I'm not kidding, it's the exact same design and everything. Which, whoa, 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 who are these guys? I don't remember them having associate's degree from Vermtech. The first day of court is wrapped up until Ken comes home and says the word battery in the most terrifying way possible. The battery. He sees Barry B. Benson is slowly starting to replace him in his perfect life, until he finally decides to do something about it. Which, yeah, is understandable. And just look at the pure rage on this broken man. All of this builds up until Vanessa finally dumps him. Yes, you heard that right. This man's girlfriend just chose a literal insect over him. Let that sink in. And by far the funniest part of this to me is the fact that they play it off as a good thing. I swear, Ken is the only sane person in this movie. And the only one asking the real questions here. Happens to be the nicest bee I've met in a long time. Are there other bugs in your life? No. So can we please just take a moment of silence for our fallen king? 
The man is down horrendous. Back in court, we get, uh... What? Things start to escalate quickly as the lawyer shows his true manipulation skills and gets Barry B. Benson's friend to sing him so he can show the jury just how dangerous bees are. By using their own smokers against them, Barry B. Benson finds a way to turn the tide of the trial, but not before, um... Living out our lives as honey slaves to the white man! You know, it just gets to the point where you wonder who wrote any of this, and more importantly, how did it seem so sane as a kid? But either way, they win the case, allowing bees to keep all of the honey they produce so they can stop working. And I'm starting to genuinely think that DreamWorks just snuck these two in here without getting permission from Disney, because it would actually be one of the more normal things to happen in this movie. However, as much as I've joked about how insane this thing is, which <laughs> rightfully so, Here's where the movie gets a little too real. And I vividly remember this from my childhood. As a kid, when they showed us Central Park all shriveled up like this, it really put things into perspective. I'm not even kidding. It truly did make me understand the value of bees and their pollination. Which, if this is what this entire movie was going for, then I guess it succeeded. We just <laughs> had to get through pure insanity to get to it, including this line. How about a suicide pact? This is a kid's movie. So, after that weirdly impactful scene, we get back to our regularly scheduled insanity. And you can't help but just die from laughter at it. Barry B. Benson realizes that they can use the pollen from the flowers at the Pasadena Festival to repollinate the world. And I find it so hilarious how, because of the lack of pollination, humanity is literally on the verge of extinction, and these people just could not care less. So anyway, the pilots get knocked out because cartoon antics, and now Vanessa has to fly a plane into a storm, transporting the last bit of hope for life on Earth. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but there was absolutely no reason for a film titled B-Movie to have these types of incredibly high stakes. And this all coincidentally happens in like two minutes. Although, again, it's still so entertaining. Especially considering how it doesn't seem like anyone actually knows the stakes of the planet right now. You know what? Barry B. Benson gives an inspirational speech about how small jobs make a big difference. So I guess the message of the movie is to just continue working in your own grave and shut up and deal with it. The pollen jocks somehow raise the weight of the plane, and Vanessa has to land on the flower created by the bees. And I think she's still messed up from that original confrontation with Barry B. Benson, as she just starts willingly trying to ram some dude in a Hawaiian shirt. I'm aiming at the flower! But, of course, all the bees work together, and they land the plan. Barry B. Benson gets to live his dream life as a pollen jocker, while leaving all of his friends and family behind who are forced to work in the twisted status quo until they die. Although, we do get an amazing cover of Here Comes the Sun, and I don't know if this is like blasphemy to say in the music community, but I actually like the cover more than the original Beatles song. I don't know, it just has this really warm and pleasant vibe to it. But we of course end it with our overlooked hero, who now is being told to let go of Vanessa and the entire life he had with her over an insect. Because, you know, <laughs> deal with it. You know, this movie is in a category of its own, and I absolutely love it for that. I really want to know what the process of making this movie was, because I'm willing to bet my fever dream idea wasn't too far off. I mean, the jokes, <coughs> bizarre. The plan for this whole thing, there wasn't one. The logic, you know, <coughs> what's that? But I seriously wouldn't want it any other way. The animation is all right. There's some good shots here and there, and the voice acting is all really well done, with Seinfeld giving his classic, somewhat annoyed charm. And of course, you know, <coughs> Ken. And even some honestly powerful messages about the importance of bees. Even though I think that whole capitalism idea would have been way stronger if at the end they allowed the bees to switch jobs anytime they wanted instead of being stuck to one because that's how it works in the real world but either way there is a reason this film has become such a meme to us and how it will never be forgotten and you know what i would much rather watch an unforgettable god knows what like this than something that would just get completely left behind and i mean the 2000s had so many forgotten animated films which by the way is something i love to cover on this channel so for this movie to still be talked about even 14 years after its release, well, then maybe the creators of this movie were as crazy as they appear. Haha, <laughs> they're still crazy. But you know what? Sometimes you need a little bit of crazy or else we wouldn't have been blessed with this. You like jazz?